Shabbat Shalom. You know, it's always great to take a day, a Shabbat day, and to rest. You know, I was wondering, I was thinking about this. Does God take a day off? Does he take a, a full Shabbat day? Uh, of course, you know, when, when they accuse Jesus of working on the Shabbat, he says to them, he says, me and my father, we work on the Shabbat. Why? Because sin doesn't stop, right? But I know that God has moments of Shabbat. Where does he get these moments of Shabbat? When you pray, exactly it. When you pray, it says that the altar of incense, when you burn this incense, it says that a sweet smelling savor to God, that means in the Hebrew, it's a savor of rest to God. And so our prayers, our worship, right? Our confession of sin, give him rest. So if you have your scriptures, let's open up to Jeremiah chapter 46. You know, we now turn to a new and timely section of the book of Jeremiah, where the prophet looks at the nations of the Middle East, Israel's neighbors. And Jeremiah is unique is that his prophecies are not so much concerned about the future of these nations as much as what brought about their fall. What we're about to see today is the other side of prophecy we often overlook. Not the foretelling part, but the part that speaks of edification, of exhortation and comfort to men. This is why the prophecies of Jeremiah here are often left out. Because they say they are past. But their value is great for everyone who desires to see God in action in time. And one thing we learn is that while the, ter the history of the Bible is mainly concerned with Israel. The nations of the world have not averted the omnis omniscient eye of God. The Spirit of God in this section shows us such familiarity with them and the way they, they live, he knows that, even to the smallest detail. And while he is pronouncing judgment on them, he also shows much love and concern for them, at least for those who will repent, because they say he he is his creation. He created them as well. And so whether the nations of the world believe or not in the God of the Bible, this section shows us that he is the God. He is the only God that everyone will face at some point. They might not know it. They might not even suspect it. But God, now being to them what Jesus is to mainstream Judaism, they will eventually all have to give account to him. This is what we learn in here. And you, you know, looking back at the history of the Middle East, we can hardly remember a time when the nations there were at peace with Israel. It seems that the only peace that existed between them was when they were subdued either by David or Solomon, or when they had their own internal problems, or their focus was temporarily diverted from Israel. But they were always at odds with Israel, always looking to harm her and to take over the land. Now in Jeremiah, God's attention is to them. We remember that at the beginning of the book, when God called Jeremiah to his work, he told them that I ordered you as a prophet to the nations, Jeremiah 1.5. He also told them, see, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. And it is in this section that Jeremiah begins this work. While Jeremiah deals with nine nations here, they are representative of all the nations of the Middle East and also of all the nations of the world. And what is the basis of this judgment? Two things stand out. First, they're in belief in the God of the Bible, which translated in pride. And the other thing is important. It is one thing we often overlook. It is how this nation treated Israel. This is something that is recurring in the scriptures. While Israel was under judgment of God and left vulnerable even now, she always was and still is an easy target, a laughing stock. And many people and nations give fully themselves to accuse the Jews of all kinds of evil and to hate them for the slightest reason. But here God says that this is far from being a free right. Who are the na these nations that Jeremiah chooses as representative? As you can see in the map, Egypt is first. The territory of ancient Egypt, Egypt is basically the same as today's Egypt. Then the Philistines, which represents today's Gaza Strip, the Strip of Gaza. 
Then Moab, Ammon, and Edom, all representing today's Jordan and Palestinian territories. Then comes Damascus, today's modern Syria. Then Kedar and Hazor, today's Saudi Arabia. These are followed by Elam, which represents portion of today's Iran. And it all ends with Babylon, as it started at the beginning, which is today's Iraq, where the Antichrist eventually will form his city in Babylon. All of these are very hot spots in today's news. In fact, these countries are not experiencing changes and even revolutions for some of them. And the amazing thing is that these things are, at the moment that I'm speaking to you, are happening at the same time. Where are all these things leading to? What will be the end result of these revolutions? Today, we will look at the first five nations and see where they're heading. Egypt, Philistia, Ammon, Moab, and Edom. <coughs> Egypt, the Gaza Strip, and Jordan, and the Palestinian territory. And I want to tell you, as we look at these things, we must realize that these times in front of us are also times of great harvest. We are in such a privileged position where we can use the word of God to bring it to the people because we're living these prophecies. And it is my prayer today that these events and these prophecies will not only wake us up of the things that are happening around us, but that they will also give us peace of mind and great assurance so that our Lord may use us to bring the good news about Yeshua Mashiach to the world, to the people around us. Now, before we go into the future, let me briefly, briefly go back in history and see the root of the Middle East conflict. It began way before Jeremiah, and looking at it will help us to better grasp what is happening and what will happen in there. I want to first bring you to the table of the nations in Genesis 10, where this conflict was prophesied. I will only mention the main leaders. The countries that are, first of all, as you can see, the world's divided into Ham, Japheth, and Shem. In the map, Ham is yellow, Shem is blue. The countries that we call Arab today find their origins with two sons of Noah, with Ham and with Shem. The majority of Arab countries today come from Ham. For instance, countries like Egypt, Libya, Yemen, Lebanon, Palestine, as it is seen in the Strip of Gaza, and even Canaan, which was the name of the people that lived in Israel before the Jews came, all came from Ham. They are not Semites, but Hamites. See Genesis 10.6. For the four sons of Ham are recognized in many contemporary Arab countries. It says the sons of Ham were Cush, Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan. The first is Cush. It occupied what we know today as southern Egypt and Ethiopia. Mitzrayim, by the way, this is the name of Egypt in, in the scriptures. Even, that Egypt is called three times the land of Ham. Put, the third name, is generally Egypt and Libya. Canaan, at the time of the conquest of the land designated as Palestine, they were there, people were there already. In Genesis 10:15, we read that Canaan begat Sidon, Sidon, ancient Phoenicia, which is today's Lebanon. Most of Israel's neighbors are here mentioned as the sons of Ham, and there is one particular people brought out in Genesis we need to pay attention to. These are the Canaanites, who play a major part in the history of Israel. You know, back in Genesis 9, Noah, when he drank the wine from his newly planted vineyard, and he became drunk. The reverence of Ham in comparison to the respect of Shem and Japheth as they dealt with their fathers in his wickedness led to Noah's prophecy that we see in Genesis 9, 25 to 27. This is an important prophecy. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. This prophetic utterance reveals that a human race will be divided according to the natural division stemming from the sons of Noah. One of them, Canaan, the youngest son of Ham, was cursed, and from him will come a servile people. Please understand that it is not all sons of Ham that are cursed. It's only one, Canaan. 
By contrast, Shem is to be the master of Canaan and blessed of the Lord God, it says. This prophecy tells us that it was through Shem, where we got the word Semite, that God's divine revelation will come. The scriptures were to be written, Israel was to be chosen, and ultimately the Messiah was to appear from them. Now, who were these Canaanites? You know, in the scriptures, the term Canaanite is a rather loose usage that defies precise definition. You know, the book of Genesis refers to a large number of ethnic groups dwelling in the country of Israel. Do you know how many there were when Joshua came in? The Canaanites were 31 separate kingdoms that were there in Israel, all representing the Canaanites. In fact, these Canaanites were always there even at the time of the election of Israel. They were in the land of Israel, well established at the time of Abraham, even when God promised Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, that he will give him this land. And what do we see in verse 6 of chapter 12? Abraham went to see the land. And he says, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Notice the words, and the Canaanites were then in the land. As if these Canaanites were planted there in opposition to God's promise to the Jewish people. This was right after the Abrahamic covenant was ratified in verses 1 to 3. The last phrase gives us a good indication of the relationship the Israelites will have with their immediate neighbors. As it was then, it is today, and will be until the second coming of Christ. These small kingdoms were always a thorn in the flesh for the nation of Israel throughout history. So Canaanites really are not one people. Furthermore, the descendants of Canaanites cannot be found. They disappeared in time. But their opposition to God's plan can be seen as a symbolism of all those who go against God's plan. These are the sons of Ham. As for those who are Semite descent, we have mainly the son of Isaac, Esau, or Edom, and the sons of Lot, Ammon, and Moab. Many prophecies were given for these people at the end, especially in our text of Jeremiah. So while none of the Arab people today can retrace with certainty their origin directly to one of the biblical people, they, I believe, do represent a blend of all these people. As for the respective territories they occupied, and we're going to see, regardless of who occupied them, they are all subject to the prophecies spoken of in the scriptures for the end time. I want to tell you that in the Middle East, the only people that can trace back their ancestry directly to their first fathers are the Jews. This is part of the miracle of the survival of the Jewish nation. Another figure in history who plays a big symbolic role is Ishmael. Today he is considered by many to be the father of the Arabs, while his physical descendants were a very small number, and today it is hard to trace them back. Ishmael still could be called the symbolic father of all those who oppose Israel. Ishmael represents for most of them the one to whom the promise was given, as opposed to Isaac. He is in many ways the father of the replacement position. For instance, in the Quran, Ishmael is highly regarded for his goodness and wisdom. The Quran teaches that Ishmael, not Isaac, Abraham almost sacrificed to God, and so Muslims believe that God's covenant promises were meant for Ishmael and not for Israel, not for Isaac, and this is the religion of Israel's neighbors, not a very good blend, right? It is believed that Muhammad, the founder of Islam, is a direct descendant from Ishmael, and so Muslims seek to lay claim to these covenant promises, namely the land of Israel. This is how opposite the Quran is to the Bible, and it is in this sense that Ishmael is a father. This ideology only contributes to fuel the, their hatred against Israel. Of course, not all Arabs are Muslims, and Ishmael is not the father of them all, because many of them are Christians. Well, this, with this background, let us go now to Jeremiah and look at his prophecies of the nations of the Middle East, as he brings them in a unique way for us. Jeremiah 46. <clears throat> and so the first country is Egypt, the land of Ham. And the first prophecy on Egypt is about their defeat at the famous battle of Carchemish in 605 BC, a city west of the Euphrates, far from Egypt. They had to go right up to wage this battle. 
Now, how important was this defeat to Egypt? What the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem was to the Jews, Carchemish was to the Egyptians. Egypt never really recovered from it. Since then, it stopped being the main influence in the Middle East. At Carchemish, Egypt went up to fight the Babylonians. It wanted to take over the world, but it lost the war. Their loss, by the way, is explained to us in verses 1 to 12. This is the first part of his prophecy. The second prophecy in chapter 46, covering verses 13 to 24, speaks of the events when the Babylonians pursued them and they went into Egypt and invaded the land. It was the end for Egypt. It was the fall of Egypt. But what is the value of these prophecies for us? What is the message they carry for us today, since they are events really in the past? Furthermore, the first part of these prophecies, verses 1 to 12, was already in his history at the time we are in Jeremiah. It happened 19 years before. The events of chapter 45 happened in 586 BC, and then we jump 19 years back in 605 BC. Why is that? Can we call this a prophecy, by the way? If it's past, if it speaks of past events, yes, we can, actually. This is part and parcel of prophecy. It does not only speak of future events, as we are accustomed to think. A prophet is one that speaks of the past, of the present, of the future, not only of the future. A prophet is primarily one that what exhorts, edifies, and comforts, as we see it in 1 Corinthians 14.3. The time factor, by the way, is not even mentioned in 1 Corinthians here. Why? Because that's not what the church wanted at this time. What's not what the church needed to hear at this time. The fact of the primary purpose of prophecy is found in one passage, Revelation 19.10. It says, for the testimony of Yeshua, the testimony of Jesus, is the spirit of prophecy. That is the very nature or purpose of prophecy is to testify of God and to bring glory to him. This is the main point of prophecy. If we hold to this original definition, many of today's self-acclaimed prophets will not stand. The word testimony here is the Greek word martyria, which we get the word martha. It implies a genuine sacrificial belief in the word of God, in what God says about today, yesterday, and the future. So what is Jeremiah's message here in this past event prophecy? You know, these are similar than the previous chapter. The, the theme is very similar to the previous cha chapter because, again, God is going to show us the nature of man, man without God. We saw how Israel acted without God. Now we're going to see the Gentiles, how they act without God. In fact, the whole world. See that the text on Egypt, in the first five verses, what Jeremiah does here is that he brings us to see the preparation of war, to see how great the Egyptians looked and how well prepared they were. And then he skips the actual war and brings us to see them fleeing away. Here how beautiful they are and bang, they're gone. Look at verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> it says, Order the buckler and shield and draw near to battle. Harness the horses and mount up your horsemen. Stand forth with your helmets. Polish the spear. Put on the armor. These soldiers, I want to tell you, must have been very impressive with polished spears, with proudly sitting on their horses. Yet the next verse continues and says, Why have I seen them dismayed and turned back? Their mighty ones are beaten down. They have speedily fled and did not look back. For fear was around them, says Jehovah. But what happened to them, says God? They looked so strong and proud and beautiful, and now they are running away. All this pompous preparation was really air. It was emptiness. It is like those who brag and brag when the time comes to produce, they run away. They get scared. They don't do anything. And this time, Egypt was the land of plenty with very impressive pyramids. It was an advanced society. They are the ones who invented the papyrus, a paper material made from plants, and they also invented the ink, the ink so they can write. These Egyptians also contributed to the field of mathematics. They also invented the calendar we use today. They were the first to specialize in medicine. And all of this made them think that they were unbeatable. 
And the very reason I want to tell you why they lost it all, why they lost our Karkemish, is because they forgot God. They actually forget God, forgot God. In fact, in Jeremiah 46, 8, at the end of it, it's, they said, I will go and cover the whole earth. They wanted to take the whole earth. They thought they were so good. After almost 1,000 years of rain, its pride did not subside, and they thought they were the ones. They did not know the very simple biblical principle that says that without God, without the God of the Bible, all of this is air. This is what Jeremiah wants us to see in here. It is air, it is nothingness. This, sin, uh, this is, I want to tell you, the sin of pride, the sin of self-righteousness. The sin of the nations in history. You know, self-righteousness is like a bottomless cup. Though you pour and pour, you will never be able to fill it. Why? Because pouring yourself into yourself adds nothing to nothing. Nothing plus nothing is what? Nothing. Egypt thought it had it all, but it had nothing. Because God was not in the picture. Right? Same message over and over in the scriptures. And so the first message to, for us today is accept God's righteousness rather than trying to accumulate your own. You will find that the righteousness he offers is real. And that is what fills the cup of sanctification. And what happened to these Egyptians has much great, greater reach than just the events of 605 BC. Egypt here stands also for all other countries. And how coincidental that tomorrow is the 10th anniversary of the attack on the Twin Towers. Its aftermath is so much like the aftermath of the war of, of Carchemish, of the Egyptians. The fall of the Twin Towers so affected us because we also thought that our society was invincible, untouchable. Is not America the land of plenty as well? We thought that we were about to build heaven on earth. But what really was destroyed, I want to tell you, was an illusion. A fantasy of an utopia we entertained. God cannot allow us to live in dreamland. We all need to go to his son and to confess our sin and accept him as our personal savior. This is the message here. And the prophecy also points to a future time. It's not only local. See Jeremiah 46.10. There's one term we will recognize here that brings the message up to the end of this world as we know it. It says, For this is the day of the Lord, God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge himself on his, uh, his adversaries. The day of the Lord. This is a recurring theme where God must bring judgment. While this term speaks of many judgments brought about on different nations, it mainly points to the last judgment of the earth, the last seven years of Daniel, the time of the tribulation. According to the Jewish prophets, the day of the Lord will precede the coming of the Messiah and the establishment of the millennium, not before this day. And there even... I remember what Zephaniah says, Zephaniah 1.18. He says, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. No riches, no gold, no army, no nuclear warfare could deliver anyone as the Egyptians thought they would, as many countries today think it would. Someone said that few people need voice lessons to sing their own praise but the worst side of pride is that this attitude of humanism relegates god to a place of an importance in our lives its philosophy is i've done great things today and i will do great things tomorrow you know our attitude sometimes reminds me of a story i read you know there was a minister a pastor a, a pastor a young student and a computer expert were the only passenger on a small plane. So the pilot came back to the cabin and said that the plane was going down, but there were only three parachutes and four people. What would they do now? So the pilot added, he says, I should have one of the parachutes because I have a wife and three small children, and he left with a parachute, one parachute. The computer whiz said, I should have one of the parachutes because I am the smartest man in the world and everyone needs me. 
So he took one and jumped. The pastor turned to the students with a sad smile and said, you are young and I have lived a rich life, so you take the remaining parachute and I'll go down with the plane. So the student said, relax, pastor. The smartest man in the world just picked up my knapsack and jumped. <laughs> I want to tell you this is what pride does. It will, at the end, it's nothing. Absolutely, it will make you do silly things. And see that at one point in the prophecy, God said something about Pharaoh, something that is so true of many. Look, look at uh, verse 17, 46, 17. It says, Pharaoh, he has passed by the appointed time. What appointed time did he pass by? You know, in the context, it's hard to tell. Some say that he did not prepare himself for the coming invasion, but one thing is for sure, is that he missed on an opportunity to save himself and his nation. He thought that he was so good, he thought that he brought heaven on earth, and his illusions, through his illusion, he passed by the appointed time, and he was caught unaware by evil. The appointed time was his appointment with God, which he passed by. This is, again, the main message about the fall of Egypt in Jeremiah 46. Really, Pharaoh's failure was that he did not consider God. This will be the failure of every other nation of the world at the end. What about Egypt today? Today, the nation of Egypt is in turmoil. For many years, Egypt was in peace, peace with Israel, but now things look like they're changing. We remember that on March 26, 1980, Egypt and Israel formally signed a peace treaty ending a state of war since the birth of Israel. It was the first such peace pact between Israel and an Arab country. In his address, Egypt President Anwar Sadat described the pact as a new chapter in the history of the coexistence of nations. Israel Prime Minister Menachem Begin declared it the third greatest day of his life. The first two, he recalled, were the Declaration of Israel's Independence in 1948 and when Jerusalem became one city and there is really rule in 1967. But after the revolution we have seen, we have witnessed these past days, it seems that this peace has gone forever. Just yesterday I read in the news that some Egyptians rioted in front of the Israeli embassy in Cairo and they went into the building and they destroyed that building. Egypt is now openly voicing its dislike of Israel. It is Daniel the prophet who speaks of its role in the end times. According to Daniel 11, Egypt will find itself fighting against the willful king, which we believe is the Antichrist, perhaps taking side with Russia, Iran, and Turkey, who will fight against the Antichrist. We do not have time to go over these prophecies now, but most importantly, Bible prophecy says that Egypt, and this is beautiful, Egypt will eventually be restored and live in peace with Israel for at least the duration of the Messianic times. This is according to Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah 19. The passage of Jeremiah ends with a word of comfort for this nation. We read in Jeremiah 46, 26. Look at verse 26. It says, and I will deliver them into the hand of those who seek their lives, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the hands of his servants. Afterwards, it shall be inhabited as in the days of old, says Jehovah. Egypt will be reestablished at the end. We read, in fact, in Isaiah 19.25 that God says to Egypt, he says, blessed is Egypt, my people. So that there's a great future eventually for this nation. Now, this chapter ends with a special promise to Israel, a promise that contains a new element. See what the two last verses says, verses 27 to 28. It says, But do not fear, O, ser o my servant Jacob, and do not be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar, and your offsprings from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest, and be at ease. No one shall make him afraid. Do not fear. O Jacob, my servant, says the Lord, for I am with you, for I will make a complete end of all the nations to which I have driven you, but I will not make a complete end of you. I will rightly correct you, for I will not leave you wholly unpunished. What is new here? What is new in this prophecy? 
You know that God calls Israel my servant. He did not call them as such before. Perhaps in Jeremiah 30 where we have the same message here. Because now Israel is not the servant. If you remember in Isaiah we studied, we saw that Israel lost that prerogative until the Messiah came, right? And he took over while the veil is on Israel. He is the servant until, until his ministry is ended. And then Israel will become the servant of the Lord. This is what God says. At the end, he will see Israel in the millennium. He says, oh, you are my servant now. This is the full reestablishment of Israel. Now, the next four territories are mentioned Philistia, Moab, Ammon, and Edom. These are literally in Israel territory as the territory was given by God to Israel in the scriptures. Putting the prophecies of these four nations together, we see that they are guilty of two main sins. One, the first one again, is their disregard of the God of the Bible. Same with Egypt. Something that was translated into pride. And the other is their hatred of Israel. Let's briefly see each of these nations. Philistia. This is, by the way, in chapter 47 of Jeremiah. Philistia is today Gaza Strip, governed by Hamas, a sworn enemy of Israel. Philistia is the origin of the name Palestine. The origin of the Philistines is given in verse 4. They are from Kaftor. This is identified as the island of Crete. But that's not all, because... If you go back to Genesis 10, 14, it says that they came from Egypt to Crete and then to Israel. They are descendants of Ham. Throughout the history of Israel, these people had the same urge as the ones occupying their land today. They always tried to expand their territory into the hills of Judah. They always wanted more and more of the land from beginning of the history of Israel up to today. Well, the people are not the same, well, they are not the same, their character is the same as it was before. And that holds true for all the other territories we're going to see today. And the Philistine territory barely changed since the beginning. If you see an old map and the map today, it is the same thing. Gaza is always there. And does the, what does the prophecy say about these people? These prophecies, as all others, have a double reference. They speak of the current times and of the very end times. See what, from verse 2 to 7, we don't have to read it, but we see how the Babylonians attack these people. There we see that the people would be so overcome by fear that we read that the fathers would not even turn back to help their children. And we're also given this important piece of information. It says that in verse 4, that the Philistines will not be able to help their allies. Now, who are their allies? Egypt? Nah. Syria? No. Nah. It says Tyre and Sidon. Interesting that Lebanon is mentioned here. And we know that today the marked enemy of Israel are Hamas in the Gaza Strip and Hezbollah in Lebanon. It's materializing. At the end, the prophecy says that there will be complete destruction of this part of the world. You can see verse 6 to 8 or verse 5 to 7. Let's read 5 to 7. It says, boldness has come into Gaza. Ashkelon is cut off with the remnant of their valley. How long will you cut yourself? O you sword of the Lord, how long until you are quiet? Put yourself into the scarboard. Rest and be still. How can I be quiet? Saying the Lord has given it charge against Ashkelon and against the seashore. There has appointed it. As opposed to Egypt, Philistia will just disappear at the end. The next prophecy is a lengthy one. It speaks of Moab. It's a very interesting prophecy. Moab is today central Jordan. Its borders fluctuated with time. In fact, that borders right now are the borders that was given, the territory that was given to the tribe of Reuben. Moab was a son of Lot, nephew of Abraham. This nation is Semite. That is, they come from the same line as the Israelites. And the history of Moab is riddled with confrontation with the people of Israel. We can think of when Moses and the Israelites came into the land. The Moabites forbade them to cross their land. The Moabite king Balak is the one who called Balaam to curse the Jewish people. However, there was one wonderful being that came out of this nation. 
Can you think of her? Ruth, the great grandmother of David. And one thing we see here that while they are evil and proud, they nevertheless seem to hold a special place in the heart of God. 47 verses are given to these people and no less than 25 places of Moab are mentioned, many of which we don't even know where they are, which shows God's deep concern even for these people. And see how God's words to them. L look at verse 31, 48, 31. He says, therefore, I will wail for Moab, and I will cry out for Moab, and I will mourn for the men of Kir Heres. Look at verse 36. It says, therefore, my heart shall wail like flutes for Moab, and like flutes my heart shall wail for the men of Kir Heres. Therefore, the riches they have acquired have perished. He was mourning for them. He was hurting for these people. It's nice. That is to see how God also loved the other nations. What then was the sin of Moab? Again, it's disregard of God. This is what God wants the nations to know. They cannot make it without him. And this translated in pride. I want to tell you that pride in its essence is a reflection of a, re of a rejection of God. Because it goes, everything goes against everything that is from God. Like it was with Satan. Remember the fall of Satan, right? It was pride that brought him to think that he was better than God. Now he uses the same pride to make believe that men can make it without God. For Moab, look at verse 7 of chapter 48. What God says. So for because you have trusted in your works and your treasures, you shall also be taken. Pride was the chief sin of Moab. It is mentioned by means of four synonyms in verse 29. It says, We have heard the pride of Moab. He is exceedingly proud in his loftiness and arrogance and pride and of the haftiness of his heart. First, we are told of his exceedingly uh, proud, pride that is. Then it speaks of his loftiness, arrogance and haftiness. These are all synonyms of what is so, something that is high, exalted, very exalted, so much so that it says in verse 26 that they were drunk, drunk with their pride. And see the conclusion in v chapter 48, verse 42. And Moab shall be destroyed as a people because he exalted himself against the Lord. But thank God, in verse 47, we see that the remnant will be left. Yet I will bring back the captives of Moab in the latter days, says the Lord. Another sin of Moab, of course, is seen in verse 27, is their hatred of Israel. See how God is good? Even though they hated Israel, he loved them. Look at verse 27. For was not Israel in derision to you, was he found among thieves? For whenever you speak of him, you shake your head in scorn. Interesting that God will notice these things. It seems that pride and anti-Semitism goes hand in hand. Ammon, his brother, is very much like Moab. You can see in the map. Of Ammon, we read in Jeremiah 49.4. Here we see the sin of her pride again. He says, Why do you boast in the valleys, your flowing valleys, O backsliding daughter? You trusted in her treasure, saying, Who will come against us? Like Egypt, like Moab, they thought that no one could touch them. This is what pride does to you. Just that somebody who who drunk and he's completely gone into alcohol. He thinks he's invincible. This is the same thing here. They also had hatred for Israel. Look at chapter 49, 1. Against the Ammonites, that says the Lord, has Israel no sons? Has his has no heir? Why then does Milcom inherit God and his people dwell in its city? Is this not what we see today in this territory? They live and act as if Israel will, will be annihilated. As if Israel has no son, as if Israel has no future. Don't they have son? Don't they have the promises of God? This is God, what, what God is telling them with his word. And after a harsh judgment of these people, we read in chapter 49, verse 6. See how God is good. But afterwards, I will bring back the captives of the people of Ammon, says the Lord. Moab and Ammon represent the Jord Jordan today. More than Jordan today. But Edom... Is like Philistia at the end. 
This one could be seen as the worst enemy of Israel through history. They will both be destroyed forever. Edom has closer ties to Israel. Edom is another name for Esau, Jack, Jacob's twin brother. The Bible says that Esau despised his birthright and he sold it to Jacob for what? For a soup. Actually, a red lentil soup. That is why he is called Edom, because Edom in Hebrew is red. And it seems that this sale was never forgotten through history. What happened to the descendant of Esau? Let me give you just two prominent individuals, because it seems that their descendants were always forever against Israel. One of them is seen in the book of Esther. His name is Haman. This man was not a Persian. It says he was an Amalekite who were descended of Esau. He was an Edomite. He plotted to kill all the Jews in the diaspora. Another one, but this other one actually went to the Messiah. Herod the Great, the Great. This man was a convert to Judaism, but his ancestry can be traced to the Edomites. He was, in the scriptures, it says, an Edomite. That is the Greek name for Edom. This man converted to Judaism and Josephus tells us that he falsified the record to make believe that he was not only Jewish, but from the tribe of Judah and also from the line of David. He really wanted to take over the cell. The hatred of Esau never subsided. It would only stop when Jesus comes back. At the end, Edom will also disappear. Look at chapter 49, verses 17 and 18. It says, Edom also shall be an astonishment. Everyone who goes by it will be astonished and will hiss at all its plagues. As in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighbors, says the Lord, no one shall remain there, nor shall a son of man dwell in it. This never happened, by the way, in history. As for its pride, Edom is really at the head of it all. In fact, you know that one full book was written about their pride and their future, the prophecy of the prophet Obadiah. Like the Egyptians, they thought that they were self-sufficient. They were not as strong and organized as the Egyptians, but they thought that they were invincible because first, due to their unique geographical situation. Have you been to Petra? Just show you a map here. Right? You know, it was very hard to get there. It was about a mile long and the average of 15 feet wide, so no army could go against them. And so they thought, ah, we're safe. Nobody can come and they would live on top of these mountains. And something else, they thought they were wise. You know, in the ancient world, the Edomite had actually a reputation for wisdom. Remember Eliphaz, you know, with Job? the foremost of Job's friends and the chief representative, he was a Temanite, it says. That is, he was from Edom. Another jo of Job's friend, Bildad, he was a Shuhite, it says, a name that is given to the mountain of Edom. See God's complaint in chapter 49, 7. He says, concerning Edom, thus says the Lord of hosts, is wisdom no more in Teman? Is counsel perish from the prudent? Where's your wisdom, says God? Look at verse 16. Your fierceness has deceived you, the pride of your heart, O you who dwell in the clefts of the rocks, who hold the height of the hill. Though you make your nest on high as an eagle, I will bring down from there, says the Lord. Human wisdom, wisdom without God, again, is nothing. Have you met an Edomite lately? They disappeared. This is like man's wisdom. It will completely disappear. This illusion can be traced back to Satan again. Ezekiel 28, 12, when he speaks of the fall, look what he says of, of Satan. He says, thus says the Lord God, you were a seal of perfection, it says. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, you were in Eden, the garden of God, precious, every precious stone was your covering. Satan was so wise that he thought he was better than God. We cannot be better than God. The end of Edom is seen in Jeremiah 49, 10. But I have made Esau bear, it says. I have uncovered his secret places, and he shall not be able to hide himself. His descendants are plundered, his brethren and his neighbors, and he is no more. As for the hatred of Israel, it's Obadiah actually who speak about it. And God says, for violence against your brother, brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. 
This again never happened in history. This is the judgment of the five of the nations of, spoken of by Jeremiah. And it was not long ago that we have seen them together again fighting against Israel. And I believe we will see them in the future. Remember the Six-Day War. Between June 5th to June 10th, 1967, Israel won the shortest war in history. All three confrontation states, you have Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, were defeated. Jordan, Moab, Imon, Edom. And do you know what kind of material, by the way, the Israeli troops captured? They captured over $1 billion worth of Soviet supply armament. Ezekiel 28, it wasn't the time yet, but it will come a time where these nations will have these, these Arab nations to fight against Israel. I want to tell you, if it was not for God, Israel will not exist today. They stand because God exists. To conclude that one thing we learned today is about pride, thinking that we can make it without God and forgetting God in what we do every single day. We always want to do things apart from God, get things faster. This is what pride is. We want to do, run faster than the Spirit of God. We want to do things now and right now. We don't want to wait. The opposite of pride is what? It's humility, it's patience, it's trust in God. I read of a little boy who went to a grocery store shopping with his mother. They were in the checkout line and the grocer asked the mother if he could offer her, her son some candy. So the mother, mother agreed. As the grocer held out the jar, encouraging the boy to reach in, the little boy shook his head. The man stretched the jar out a little further and told the boy that he could take as much as he would like. The boy continued to say no. With a confused look on his face, the grocer gave one last effort. The boy finally said, I want you to give it to me. So the grocer happily took some candy out of the container and handed it to the boy who quickly uh, offered his thanks. So when he and his mother were in the car, they went in the car on their way, she asked him, she said, why wouldn't you take the candies yourself? Why did you tell him to give the candy to you? So her son replies, he says, mommy, he says, his hands are bigger than mine. <laughs> Smart boy. Smart boy. He understood that the hands of the source is much bigger. If God's children would simply let him be God, they would soon discover that his hands are much bigger than their own. Let's bow our head in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your presence among us this morning. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit in us to guide us and to always remind us that we are your children. We also thank you for your word. We know that we can always find you among its powerful pages. And so, Lord, I pray today for all those present here in this congregation. Some here today need healing. Some need revival in their hearts. Some need restoration in their friendships. Some need forgiveness for their sins. Lord, today we need you. And for those here this morning who wonder if they've been left behind, who fear you've forgotten them, teach them that your delays are not denials. May we wait on you, and may our strength be renewed and our souls be restored. May we this day touch the hem of your garment and receive the healing, the strength, and the answers we need. In Yeshua's name, amen. May the Lord bless you all. If you have any comments... To get in touch with us, you can do so by telephone, 1-888-685-5902. Locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. You can also reach us through our website at www.arielcanada.com. Again, the phone number is 1-888-685-5902 or locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. Website address is www.arielcanada, all one word, A-R-I-E-L, Canada.com. Be blessed. Shalom.